Hello, everyone, again. Uh, it's been a few hours since I was on stage. Um, so uh, it's the final session. We've uh, uh, been here now for uh, seven, eight hours, and it's been a lot of information. And I've really, you know, I've taken notes, chatted with people. So, um, you know, it's been a long day, but I'm going to, you know, muster my last bit of energy for this panel, which I'm very excited for. And uh, yeah, on the topic of just a lot of different uh, uh, things being discussed, I've asked the speakers to do a very difficult thing, kind of summarizing today's summit, or at least kind of capturing the spirit of all the different topics that have been discussed. And this is, of course, not an easy task. Um, you know, we are talking about, you know, kind of looking at each, uh, uh, you know, of the most pressing issues on the EU's agenda through an open source perspective. But luckily, I'm not alone, or actually, I'm not even the one that is going to do this. Uh, instead, I have this great panel with me. So I have the pleasure to welcome Shelley McKinley, the Chief Legal Officer of GitHub, Francesca Bria, President of the Nas uh, Italian National Innovation Fund, Henri Vadé, uh, Ambassador for Digital Affairs, uh, France, and Maria Francesca Spatulizzano, Acting Envoy on Technology of the United Nations. So, of course, there are a lot of different things that uh, I want to do with such an esteemed uh, panel. Um, but, you know, in many ways, I'm trying to turn around the perspective here. We've, we've um, discussed all these different uh, uh, topics. So one thing that uh, we're going to start talking about is kind of the challenges faced by open source. You know, what are the potential risks of this mode of, of development and innovation? And if so, you know, how do we get over these challenges? Um, I think we've, it's become quite clear today that open source is quite important when we take on uh, the current and future challenges the world uh, faces. And then I'll try to end with a forward-looking and positive note. Uh, I'll ask the panelists uh, for their thoughts on how we can secure and strengthen open source, the open source industry, and the open source developers in order for uh, you know this this uh, uh, collaborative innovation to meet the demands uh, that uh, you know we are essentially putting on it here. So we're talking about capacity building, support, protection. So. Um, I think we can all agree that for uh, uh, global open source development and collaborative innovation, uh, we've touched on this earlier today, geopolitical instability is an important external factor to keep in mind. And then software security is an important kind of internal factor to uh, open source uh, when looking at the global software supply chain. So. Uh, Francesca, I'm going to start by turning to you. And we kind of had two Francesca, so I'll call Maria Francesca, <laughs> Maria Francesca, and then Francesca, Francesca. So uh, Francesca, I'd like to start by asking you to kind of contextualize from your view, um, open source and the political economy of data and infrastructures, technological yes. sovereignty, geopolitics <laughs> of the stack. Yeah, uh, just from your view, how, how are these things interlinked? Okay, so thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you and to conclude such a marathon. <laughs> so it's going to be interesting to see the roadmap for the future. Obviously, this is a gathering of the leading open source community in Europe, and I'm convinced that open source and its community will play a big role for Europe to regain um, its technological sovereignty, but also to provide a vision for what it can be a digital society at the service of um, citizens and people. So let me uh, first provide, yeah, maybe an overview about what are the key challenges. First of all, let me say that I think we are in a very different place today because um, in this pandemic period, I think we all uh, saw how digital infrastructures, which is connectivity, data, AI and platforms have proved to be critical infrastructure of society on which essential services such as work, healthcare, food delivery and education depend upon. And there was also very big debate in parliaments at European level and national level on how this should be actually recognized even in constitutions as a fundamental rights for people access to uh, technology because what it is important is that we uh, understand that accelerating digitization is not enough but it is necessary to give it a direction which means that uh, we want to go in a place where 
we uh, exploit the power of digital technology and connectivity to attain both social and environmental sustainability. So having said that, I think that Europe at this point has a chance to propose to the world a, its own uh, idea for a digital society that, um, let's say, uh, put at the very core of it um, democracy, fundamental rights of citizens, of course, combining the need for Europe to regain leadership in innovation, so dynamism, um, capacity to compete at scientific and technological level. So not only Europe as seen as the big regulatory power for the digital society, but also Europe that has the capacity to compete at, a, at, a, at innovation and scientific level, but to do that with an uncompromised defense of autonomy, sustainability, self-determination, and democracy. And I think this is um, probably, you know, what I call uh, Europe digital sovereignty that requires, of course, an holistic regulatory framework and that, that there's, uh, we can agree that's where Europe is doing a good job with the Digital Service Act, the Digital Market Act, the Data Governance Act and so on, proposing a new kind of constitution for the digital age, uh, for the digital age. But we also need a strategic, far-sighted approach when it comes to regain control over our own critical infrastructures and a digital industrial policy. So this is where the good news come in, because historical, historically we have around in the next generation EU, which is a big public investment plan uh, for uh, the Europe Green Deal and the digital transition with social cohesion, Europe will put around 400 billion investments into critical technologies such as AI, microprocessors, 5G technologies, uh, quantum, um, cloud, cybersecurity, and so on. And I think this is not only about technology, of course, it will impact all sectors of the economy and society across everything, as we are seeing with the uh, shortage, um, the chip shortage, which is hitting the automotive industries and, and so on. And I think, um, as I'm saying here, the challenge will be to put forward our strengths, principle, principles and values, so a digital humanism, with a unique European touch to innovation that guarantees the strategic autonomy of Europe and uh, actually makes Europe more independent from foreign critical infrastructures and do that by really fostering the ecology, the technology ecosystem of Europe. So I'm one of the, of the people that actually advocate for Europe to have its own uh, digital champions. Uh, which means creating an ecosystem where we're going to have to boost, um, uh, you know, um, startups and scale up at, at European level. Uh, we need um, a EU market for um, for technology and the pan uh, um, European uh, regulatory regime. And I think now there is big discussion and big expectations under the EU, uh, the French presidency actually to accelerate this part of the work and maybe create also a big digital sovereignty fund or a big digital innovation fund for Europe, where we um, we um, I want to say we accelerate the demand for native tech products that are suited to European preferences and conditions. And this can be done on one side through investment and investment in equity and, you know, scale up and uh, making sure that our startups can grow. So it's not only incumbents, it's also the SMEs and the innovation capacity that we have in Europe. But we also have standard setting, we have smart um, public procurement, um, and, and we can have standards that are about interoperability, open source, open formats, data sovereignty, and those standards can be also integrated in public procurement, which I think it can be a very, a very uh, big boost. So let me finish my uh, first intervention by saying that we do need options that effectively create open source market and interoperable markets in smart mobility, for example, in, um, in smart city services, in services that fight um, CO2 emissions and climate change and so on. And I think the open source movement can make a big difference there. 
because we need to, to build this open source ecology and we need to work on this kind of standards. So just uh, ending, may, may, making an example that uh, for now we have a digital ID that's being rolled out throughout Europe. We are all, all using these uh, EU COVID passports, right, to move around. We have um, the need to create uh, a digital payment system across uh, Europe and uh, data infrastructure such as data trust, which, has, which are privacy enhancing and rights preserving. And I think this kind of underlying basic infrastructures that are going to be fully European, they should be built using open source, open standards, interoperability, security, privacy, and ethics by design. And then they should be open up for all innovators to create value on top of that. And so I think the open source community should be a fundamental part on how we build this uh, public European infrastructure so on top of which we are gonna create a digital society of the future. Okay, thank you, Francesca. And I'm thinking, you know, part of this vision that you're putting forward, of course, um, in part of the summit's uh, core message is the role of uh, open source and open tech in this space. And I'm thinking many of these policy efforts, uh, uh, you know, let, let's be frank, there are some frictions between the different blocks, uh, uh, be it China, America, and Europe when it comes to, to uh, policy priorities, et cetera. But I'm thinking maybe if we're looking at open source, and this is a question to you, Shelley, uh, if we're looking at open source uh, and the security and software security in general, uh, GitHub also participated in the White House summit now in January that uh, Brian and Roberto spoke of earlier. Um, just kind of look, looking at the, the transatlantic relationship here uh, through a lens of open source, could open tech collaboration be an interesting bridge between the US and EU in these otherwise like slightly times of some friction that collaboration could actually be in this space a lot easier? Thanks, Asper. First of all, thank you for inviting me to join today uh, from San Francisco. Uh, it's just a pleasure to be here to uh, get to share some of the thinking that GitHub has been doing on these issues and to also listen and learn uh, from others. I think you may have given me probably the single hardest uh, job, which is to try to summarize what happened today while I was sleeping. Um, but I am, I'm excited to watch some of the playback uh, uh, when that's out, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, so thanks for having me. Um, I just wanted to quickly say that, you know, nobody wins in security unless everybody wins. It's really a global team sport. So, um, you know, at GitHub, we are uh, resting our security response on a couple of pillars. First, it's, it is about that collaboration with the broader community. Uh, right now, we're doing that a lot in the Open Source Security Foundation, uh, where we're coordinating with governments, academics, industry, and others. Um, and we're doing that through the developer tools on our platform, like Dependabot, CodeQL, uh, that help developers write more secure code, uh, and in our education and skilling efforts. And so by giving developers the technology and the tools and the know-how they need, we're helping to empower developers contribute back to the community. Um, but beyond security, uh, which is really the current and most important um, collaborative focus of today, open technology does help build bridges more broadly. Um, if you think about the trends that Francesca <clears throat> was speaking of, um, it can seem that the world's trending away from that collaboration. Um, however, I think this desire for autonomy, this legitimate desire to control digital future actually brings what's a great opportunity for bridges to be built with open collaboration. Um, because anyone can learn and study and, and use open source, um, that local skilling and expertise can be developed through collaborating openly with experts abroad. Um, now, you mentioned the, the, the White House meeting that GitHub attended along with others. Um, and I think we should really think about this as just a starting point um, to build that collaboration, as many of the policymakers around the world are trying to wrap their arms around all of these issues. Um, but there's definitely a broad and diverse community um, that's building around things like the Open Source Security Foundation, which includes really members from around the world, including, um, you know, across from an from an American point of view across the Atlantic, um, on the European continent, and and many others. Um, so, as the home for open source development, GitHub really is in a unique position to contribute to the efforts, um, and we we take that responsibility very seriously. It's a responsibility, it's an opportunity for us as a company. Um, 
there's definitely going to be other venues for collaboration and we're entirely supportive of those venues. Um, the more visibility to the issue, the better. Uh, the imp most important part is that we should have be having these conversations really openly um, and in partnership around the world with governments, industry and open source communities as, as well as the uh, academic security researchers. Um, so when it comes to security, it's a global team sport and nobody wins unless everybody wins. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm now moving over to Henri. Uh, very excited uh, to have you here on the panel as we have touched on geopolitics and open technologies throughout the day and I think every single panel in one way or another. So uh, it's a privilege to have uh, a diplomat uh, on a panel who is also interested in digital affairs and working with digital affairs and, and um, uh, has an interest in open tech. So I would like to ask you how you see this relationship between the importance of open technologies in times of, of unstable geopolitics. Uh, is it a challenge or an opportunity for, for further deployment and strengthening of, of uh, open tech in, in Europe and beyond? Okay. First, thank you for inviting me to this important event, but maybe most of all, thank you for organizing these events, which is so important. And yes, unfortunately, I have to recognize that we are, we have entered in a phase of model conf confrontation of models, <laughs> of uh, national models, of uh, strong power relation, and perhaps of contestation of democracy itself. So we have to organize ourselves because it will be the next 10 years at minimum. Um, and this climate may work against openness and against the commons and against, against the open internet as we knew. For example, it could push some, each country to promote its national champions. But from my perspective and the, probably the French perspective, this climate simply makes open technologies indispensable. This is the only solution, in fact. Um, First, and we will, uh, you may know that next Monday we do organize a, a, a conference about European digital sovereignty. And you will hear my minister explaining that open technologies is the only way to promote a European sovereignty. So a sovereignty which is a, not to control internet, but to be free within internet not protectionist or I don't know, but uh, about strategic autonomy and especially a non-rival sovereignty. Because when I use or contribute or develop a free software, a common, a digital common, open data, I'm more free and I help my, my neighbors and, my, and everyone to be more free. It's a non-rival sovereignty. So first, that's a very important and maybe very European vision of sovereignty. And if we don't convince everyone to adopt this, this approach of sovereignty, if we let confrontational sovereignty, hegemonic sovereignty becoming the, the framework, the world will be very unstable. That's the first idea. Uh, but moreover, and that's very important too, um, so I can announce just for you that my minister will announce next Monday that we will create a, an informal group of most European countries to work together to, to see if we can define a European initiative for digital commons, because that's important. The second point is that, the, uh, just mention, I just want to mention this very simple evidence, uh, a shared infrastructures, because it's led to interdependence. It's a great factor of stability. If, for example, we let the fragmentation of internet happen. The temptation for one country to attack another will be higher because in, in the actual world, uh, if I hit the public core of the, another country's infrastructure, I hurt my country too. So uh, that's very important to see this. Interoperability, openness, sharing infrastructure are a great factor of peace and stability. And let's imagine for five minutes, a world with different internets, different telecom protocols, different governmental infrastructure and how inst unstable it will be. And maybe my third and last idea, but because we are European, um, I consider that, but it's the same for US, but we 
mature democracies, we can articulate democracy, individual freedom, and sovereignty through this kind of, of approach with shared uh, infrastructure, with contributive common, with multi-stakeholder governance. And in fact, just remember this, we pretend that the people is the sovereign. Yeah, we have democracies, we want the sovereignty of the people. But if there is no connection between the sovereignty of the people and a kind of capacity of the state, <laughs> And if there is no articulation between both, in fact, the sovereign people is not sovereign. So as democracies, we, we have to, to promote a world with more commons, more contribution, more transparency, more concertation, et cetera. And uh, that's also a good way to, to, to promote our vision of human rights or of democracy, because here we don't give lessons, we contribute to useful infrastructure for everyone. And we say, you can take my tools if you want. And uh, it's good for development, democratic and economic development. Um, maybe that's my, my, my answer. I just want to add something because during all this process and sometimes today, I heard, I don't know why. Uh, in fact, I don't understand really. Some people fear that a promotion of open source, free software, commons, could be a threat on economic prosperity. I hear some of this sometimes. And in fact, I clearly don't understand. You know, I come from sciences. Uh, I, I was trained as a biologist. And let's imagine uh, what would become uh, the pharma pharmaceutical industry without the public science. They need the public science. They need common knowledge. They, they, they need decennies of research to be able to create value and money. So it's exactly the same with uh, global digital infrastructures. Uh, we all benefit of the public of internet, of free software, of uh, open infrastructure, etc. And that's better even for companies, in fact. So I just wanted to share this with you. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Andy. And I think that it's an, a good link uh, back earlier today to the, the panel with the economists. I, uh, I think it's very interesting also to see. I think everyone in the open source ecosystem uh, and audience here knew what you said is true about, about let's say, uh, op open information, open sharing, and the economic value of this. But it's also nice. I mean, our study from Open Forum Europe was part of this, but we're getting hard evidence that supports um, the economic impact of opening up to technologies as well. But uh, I'm going to take this chance here. Um, there was somebody in the comments many hours ago at the event that was talking about um, uh, essentially the, the, the kind of digital impact across the globe for understandable reasons, at least from my point of view, since it's the EU Open Source Pol uh, Policy Summit, we are quite EU-centric in our discussions here, and that's why I'm very excited to have uh, um, Maria Francesca from the UN here, uh, taking a broader perspective than we might have in our day-to-day -day work. So, so uh, Maria Francesca, perhaps uh, I'm gonna throw a big question to you and then do with it as you will. Um, in some ways, the UN is the world's main platform for global plat uh, collaboration. So, um, and the, the sustainable development goals is a great formulation of shared goals that, you know, the UN member states have come together to try to solve. And then, of course, I want to ask you to look at these through the perspective of open source. So, so how do you see the link between the, the SDGs and, and the open source and collaborative innovation? Thank you, Asser, and uh, hello, everybody, colleagues, friends, distinguished participants. Indeed, it's a big question, but it is a very good one, because as you said, the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals are a shared agenda. It's something that every country uh, of the UN has subscribed to and uh, remains a, a very powerful tool for us to push for a, a transformation for change. So it is really important for us to, to keep that in mind and to see how digital cooperation can help accelerate the achievement of the SDGs. And I have to say the Secretary General in his roadmap for digital cooperation stressed the importance of digital public goods, such as what we're talking about, open source software, open data, and this is part of his vision for a more open, inclusive, free digital future for all. 
And one of the foremost priorities for the United Nations is indeed to narrow the digital divide because internet connectivity is a prerequisite uh, to access uh, the resources online and support, as I was saying, sustainable development uh, from education to health, uh, emergency preparedness, very important, e-commerce, all sorts of things. So for increased connectivity to contribute to the achievements of the SDGs, we need open source solutions because this can be, uh, you know, the real bridge, as you were already saying, uh, Andre, and uh, can be and should be implemented at the local level to address the local needs. And uh, this would in turn build also trust and generate interest and generate value for, uh, for the public. So by increasing equitable access to digital public goods, we can make real progress towards equal participation in the benefits of technology. And in doing so, we will be hitting the calls from member states here at the United Nations, from the local communities, from the civil society groups, for technology to be more equally and openly shared among all. To make clearer this point, let me recall, you know, how open source technologies are contributed to, for instance, COVID-19 response. I don't have to go, you know, into a lot of details. We're all experiencing this every day. Open source health management systems are helping uh, public health officials. Uh, E-learning resources are ensuring children to be able to continue learning and digital public infrastructure for identif identification and financial inclusion built on open source platform have helped to identify and provide aid to those who have been most affected. So the tragedy is when access is not there, let's be clear. But we are only at the beginning. And to fully realize the potential of open source technologies, we must uphold the principles. And, and I go back to the values you were talking about a minute ago openness, transparency, collaboration, inclusivity. And these are the really inherent, inherent principles of the culture of open source itself. So at the UN, my office, the Office of the Tech Envoy, is working closely with other UN agencies like UNDP and UNICEF through a multi-stakeholder partnership also with Digital Public Good Alliance, precisely to promote the deployment of public goods, digital public goods, open source solutions, and that they adhere to key standards, such as doing no harm, have robust governance mechanism, and help achieve the SDGs. And through this alliance, uh, DPGs in the areas uh, I mentioned, health financing, have been very successfully shared and used by development partners in countries around the world. So more generally, I also want to mention we have a technology facilitation mechanism, the TFM, which was created uh, as part of the 2030 agenda as well and promotes open sources approach and a um, mandated by the member states an online platform to be a gateway to um, existing science, technology and innovation uh, initiatives, mechanisms, programs. Uh, to, to work not only for the UN, but also beyond the UN. This platform that we launched uh, and is called TFM 2030 Connect serves as a one-stop single access point to technology and knowledge resources uh, within and outside, uh, as I said, the UN for the SDGs and, and we are very pleased this is attracting a lot of interest for those engaged in open access and scientific research. So what I'm trying to say here is that we are very committed as UN uh, to the principles of open sources but also we provide um, tools for exchange, for uh, we convene, you know, offer platforms where this can be uh, discussed and uh, and this goes in the direction of the bridges, building bridges. Because yes, in a world which tends or, or might tend towards the vision, we have to talk to everybody and bring everybody, if 
as much as possible around some common ideas, some common principles, how to handle uh, an internet which remains a global, uh, global public good. Yeah, thank you very much. And I have to say, I mean, going through this and again, I'm trying to just, you know, I'm connecting dots with a lot of other panels throughout the day. And I think it's fair to say that um, we are asking quite a lot from open source when we're we're talking about the uh, um, sustainable development goals. We're talking about uh, securing uh, digital autonomy, um, uh, you know, driving the green transition, etc. So I think here will be important, and this will, uh, you know, I think be 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 one of the big questions for, for us going forward is how can we make sure that open source can kind of deliver on the uh, promises uh, or, or the promise that we've discussed here today. And uh, I'll, I'll jump around a little bit here, but I'm thinking, Francesca, since you, you you're uh, close to to uh, investments, and you mentioned the the uh, next generation EU, uh, it's an interesting vehicle uh, uh, to think about. A lot of public money is being invested in the digital transformation, uh, specifically looking at let's say. Uh, uh, Maybe jump-starting capacity building in the in the um, European open source industry. How do you see links there? What could be done? Yeah, no, I think this is a is a great question because I think we are all outlining a vision of digital sovereignty, meaning sovereignty to the people, versus otherwise a kind of digital colonialism where we are all being gonna be dependent on um, you know, what's the actual um, situation today, which is not what we are actually <laughs> describing as this kind of a little bit utopic future. We're actually in a moment of a, a very, very big con industrial concentration and concentration of power in the digital economy. Whereas we know we have five to seven, you know, big tech players, the GAFAM on the US side and the BAT, let's say on the Chinese end that control around, you know, a market evaluation of nine, 10 uh, trillion US dollars. And of course, this creates uh, the kind of impact that we see for uh, democracy, antitrust, the preservation of public good, and also, you know, the ability to really put in motion, I think the vision that Maria Francesca was describing which is a technology that's oriented to the public interest and the public good that help us to uh, really tackle the big challenges of society, which is, you know, the green transition, climate change, um, the, uh, like inequalities and, you know, living in, uh, in, in better cities that are going to be equipped to face these kind of big challenges, better education, be better public health care and so on. So I think it's a fundamental shift that is required. So obviously we have to, uh, I think, see the tools that we have as part of a bigger game change, a, a big, bigger game where we need to step up, I think, at policy level both at European level, but also and in particular at international level. And I think um, definitely on one side, uh, regula regulation is going to be important. So let's not underestimate what we can do with that. But as you're saying, we can also, uh, for example, with these big investment programs that we have now, make sure that we really build capacity for the open source uh, let's say, digital public good ecosystem that we want to nourish. And I think for me, I mean, one very powerful tool there is the, uh, is the fact that you put open source interoperability, open tech specification and privacy enhancing specifications and protocols in public procurement. I mean, I will never <laughs> end by saying how this is important. For example, when I was the chief technology officer of the city of Barcelona, we actually we built with UN Habitat, which is the agency uh, that's working a lot on urbanization and with cities, a digital coalition for uh, um, cities digital rights coalition, where we're really promoting this kind of value starting from the ground up from cities. Uh, but we also try to integrate this kind of clauses in public procurement. Why? Because then when you invest all this public money to create the next generation, you know, infrastructure or tools or application that will be scaled up at national and European level, you do it with those kind of standards, protocols and principles embedded into, you know, 
the, the rules. And then you, you start shifting a lot of this investment and capacity to the open source community and to and, and, and start growing it. And then, of course, you're going to have to match it with other kind of investments in equity and scale ups and also do technology transfer to integrate the, you know, the smaller companies with the big industry. And you're going to need to strengthen the academic research, as we're saying, not only in security, privacy and so on, but also on a broader scale. Um, but I think I think this is the way to uh, to to build capacity, as you say, to strengthen strengthen the industrial capacity of the open source ecosystem. And uh, I think it's urgent to do it uh, right now. And let me also just mention one topic that I think is very important. We have to realize that this is um, actually an obstacle to the vision that we want to achieve, is that we understand that um, this is a democratic digitization goal that we are pushing forward is about defending the data sovereignty of citizens, their autonomy and their constitutionally guaranteed rights. And we know that the business model of the digital ecosystem, which today is based a lot on the exploitation and manipulation of personal information and data. So that is actually deeply privacy violating and many times opaque and many times that escape the democratic control. It is problematic. It, it must be fixed. It's, it must be changed. And I also see that link between the open source and the economic development as part of this conversation, because we do not want to have this um, surveillance capitalism as the core of the digital economy. It's not sustainable and it can represent a real threat to our democratic value and our democratic societies as we know it. So we need to shift the business model and I think the open source um, ecosystem and 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 also uh, the ability to redistribute the value in the community and to create digital public goods is a way to shift away from that kind of um, let's say a bit rapacious uh, business model that at the moment is creating a very strong concentration of power in the hands of too few companies. So we need to make sure that the digital economy develops in a way that doesn't create irreversible concentration of power and concentration in the marketplace. Uh, thank you, Francesca. And I'm, I'm thinking, uh, they, uh, you know, any kind of vision, including um, uh, where we, we talk about open source at the, the heart. It's very, um, one thing that we always talk about at uh, Open Forum Europe is uh, to not necessarily just always, um, uh, you know, if you're a part of the open source industry, looking to, to governments and say, oh, you should just change the laws, you should do this and that, but also kind of look in, into yourself and seeing like, okay, what can we do in order to, to kind of increase our capacity in our industry to meet these demands? And I think it's been interesting to, to hear today from so many representatives from the public sector talking about ways of increasing the capacity of the, the public sector to engage with the ecosystem. A thing that we often talk about is there's this classic metaphor of, of the cathedral and the bazaar in open source. And I think in, in the policy space, the, 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 the public sector is very much like the cathedral here, trying to interact with the bazaar of, of, uh, uh, of open source and this very, very horizontal ecosystem. And I think here there's an interesting question we see the United Nations has conversations about, you know, building an open source program office. France has just presented its new strategy where it's called a mission, but I personally call it the, the French National OSPO. The European Commission has, has its, there are interesting plans in Germany that we've discussed. And I'm thinking here, uh, uh, um, uh, Maria Francesca, uh, fr from your eyes, the conversations are, are around uh, the open source program office in the UN. How how is that a vehicle to to for governments to kind of close the gap to to other stakeholders in the ecosystem? Oh, thank you, thank you for mentioning this. My office is very supportive uh, of the creation of this open source uh, program office in the UN, with the actually partnership of uh, GitHub and and others uh, like uh, I mentioned the. Uh, Global Digital Public Goods Alliance. And this office uh, has the potential to improve the deployment, indeed, of open source technology and also to cultivate a culture of open source approaches uh, throughout, across the UN system. 
and this can of course lead to greater adoption of open source uh, uh, resources through the UN but also build the capacity enhance technical assistance we provide to member states uh, help to bring about digital solution that, that can be more broadly shared and scaled up so I, I really think it's a very good initiative and we encourage it uh, and we encourage the collaboration between the UN OSPO and the French and European offices uh, uh, together with those in the developing countries uh, to the extent possible. And, and so there are other mechanisms, as I mentioned, in the UN, which can also contribute. I will mention here only the Internet Governance Forum, where we were in, uh, only in December in, in Katowice. And uh, one last consideration, uh, because, of course, at the UN, we, we think global by definition. The Secretary General has put forward a proposal through a report called Our Common Agenda, a proposal which is part of his vision for the next uh, decades to um, um, converge around what we have called a global digital compact in the context of a, a, a broad summit of the future to take place in 2023. What is this global digital compact? Is a, a, a way to agree, is a document where we hope to bring agreement, convergence among all the actors at the global level in the technology track to the basic principles and some guidance for governments, for the public sector, but also the private sector, the companies, the society, so that these principles which would form the compact and are adhered to help us to keep the, the internet we want, you know, the digital future we want, uh, based uh, anchored in the UN values and in uh, an open system, including, of course, global public goods. So I strongly encourage you to have a look at this and uh, to please contribute with your ideas, because we are at the beginning of the process which will lead to the global digital compact. And I really encourage everyone to come up with ideas and help us. And, and of course, as we are talking about the EU, I note that only uh, a week ago, the EC proposed the EU Declaration of European Digital Rights and Principles. And we want, of course, to benefit from the uh, very important discourse at the European level. And we call on European colleagues to bring it to the UN to, you know, give us the benefit of your advances in this area so that we can really make it global. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and then uh, just to kind of start rounding this off, because, it, you know, we've, of, of course, invited a lot of policymakers that are yeah, quite positive to the general positions and ideas around open technologies. Uh, I'm turning to you here, Shelley, because uh, um, we've been talking about both public investments, capacity buildings, the, the opportunities to come with uh, open tech. Um, but underpinning is all this is the assumption that open source create it creates value at a societal level so uh, and, and this is a bit of a leading question because when we wrote our study we did it with a lot of github data um but in your view how can we convey these uh, uh, these important messages to more policymakers? Uh, there's still this big discrepancy between where open source is in the world in you know driving the technological transformation and where it is in the political debate uh, we heard a mention of the eu standard strategy there's no outward external looking eu open source strategy how do we take bring the conversation to the next level thanks aster um uh, first, I'd just say that um, taking advantage of all the collaboration that we've been talking about today, as you've noted, really depends on stakeholders seeing the value uh, in that, particularly government stakeholders. Um, it's easy for individual developers that are working on a project to see the value. Certainly, we all here that are talking today see the value in open source, but it's not always, uh, as you note, so clear uh, for policy folks that are setting policy to actually see the value in it. So we need to find better ways to measure it. Um, and ensure that everyone is incentivized to invest. Um, you know, how do we do that specifically? Um, first, we need more understanding. Uh, we need more data on the value of open source collaboration uh, that will help us better understand on a country level for international development, public policy, and economics. 
Um, as you mentioned, GitHub is, has been a big contributor to these, uh, these efforts and we're uniquely positioned to do so um, because we are the home for more than 73 million developers around the world. Um, the second thing I would say is we need more proof points that make it really clear and tangible uh, as to the value of open source. We need to set people uh, free to work on these problems and really bring those back as proof points. Traditionally, when we think about innovation um, and research is measured by the patents that are granted, um, but of course those measurements ignore uh, innovations that are made available as open source for everyone uh, to use and modify and to, and to learn from. Um, and despite the fact that there aren't patents, there is no question that open source innovation has a long history and a demonstrated value to society. In fact, um, it's become so commonplace that it's hard to imagine what our lives would be like without the advancements that have been created by open source. Uh, it underpins Wikipedia. Um, it underpins the developer tools that create software and machine learning today. Um, and it even underpins the internet itself. Uh, so I think we've all lived and we've experienced and we've been benefited from the value of open source. And we do that every single day. But now I think we just have to be better at measuring it. Yeah, that's perfect. And that kind of start, we, we're already a bit over time, but the good thing with uh, being the, 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 the executive director of OEF is that I can take some liberties when it comes to uh, uh, this conference. Uh, but um, uh, I want to end up and I will give Andre you you kind of the final word here. Um, uh, considering uh, uh, Minister Monchalan's declaration earlier uh, um, that there will be a ministerial meeting in March of the public sector ministers in which open source will be high on the agenda. Andre, I know you, you've been thinking a lot about these questions probably we're going to be honest more than many of these ministers that that are going to meet. So. Uh, I'm asking you this because, of course, you also have the chance of maybe having an exchange with the minister. If there is one message that you would like to share or perhaps see at the agenda of that meeting where the EU ministers of the public sector uh, uh, comes together on the topic of open source, what, what would you like to see there? Okay, and very briefly. So, yes, for a long time, the classical industrial policies was about fin financing companies and we didn't really help open source communities. And uh, sometimes we made a mistake because we, we believed that it was just about free. Uh, for, for example, we didn't notice that sometimes even if it's, it's a contributive free software, they need uh, hosting machines, they need... Uh, <laughs> But I'm thinking that here things are changing, and that's the first important message. Um, and for example, in the diverse EU investment plans, uh, recovery plans, etc., you observe that we we will, as European, inject a lot of money about uh, teams that develop solution, and especially uh, about uh, cooperative projects uh, with open source and open tech uh, to meet the grand challenge of independence. And it's not anymore seen as an anti sovereign perspective. So first, I observe that probably the, the mindset of the political class is changing and uh, we are entering in a new, in a new world about this issue. But that's not enough because, of course, if you want to chain uh, the state, the government, the administration, your economy, it's not just about financing. Uh, open source solution and some of them need financial help and others don't need this. So, and probably uh, that's what Minister Monchalin will exchange with your, your counterparts. Uh, you, you, you know maybe that I was a French state CTO for five years, during five years. Of course, you need to change your, as Francesca said, you need to change also your relation with these, those ecosystems. You need to be part of those ecosystems. You need to contribute yourself. You need to hire people with different uh, profiles. You need sometimes to change slightly your organization because if you send a, a public servant in a class, in an open open lab of an open community, he cannot go with a clear mandate. <laughs> he has to, he needs the right to to give the point to the other to change the mind. So you you need to and at the end of the day, you have to change all the state organization. So probably what we will exchange with our counterparts is that, yes, we need uh, money. And for example, 
the initiative I was speaking about uh, is also to have a um, European investment fund to be able to help the perennity and the sustainability of some great digital commons and strategic digital commons. But that's absolutely not enough. And it's time to, to learn how to use the solution. I, I try to be brief, but for example, if you really want to use this solution, very often you have to change the mix of your CTO's team too, because in too many states or public organization, uh, you just buy for decades. So if you, you need to really learn to, to hire developers and uh, makers and doers, and the, so you have to change the mix. And if you want to hire this kind of people, you cannot manage them. I see that Francisca agree. You cannot manage them with, in the old the bureaucratic fashion. You have to give, give them sense and autonomy. So you have to change that. So it's time to, to learn to be part of those communities, to learn how to contribute. For example, all our national geographical data should be on OpenStreetMap for a long time. Why don't we do this, <laughs> in fact? And uh, it's time, so that's my second point. There may be one last point, but the more I work on this issue in international field, the more I think that we will have to stand for the public core of the open, uh, free, and unique internet. That, that will be more and more important. And that Europe could, could be a very important player. And uh, I may surprise uh, Chile, but I personally consider that Europe is a, um, the cradle of the open standards, in fact. In fact, we did prototype TCPIP, we did invent HTML on the web, Linux, Bluetooth, ADSL, because we have this, we, we like open standards. And so we have a kind of responsibility to, to protect them now, because seriously, uh, there is a threat on the, 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 the global internet those days. Yeah, so, thank you very. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that. I think that's a great last message. I think, it, you know, just to try to summarize this panel in one sentence, I think it, it's interesting to just to think that um, one might think that there is this uh, conflict between uh, the, the strive for, for autonomy uh, and let's say applying international collaboration across borders between individuals, companies, to tackle the grandest of challenges that we face. Uh, but in fact, it is just more openness and the application of more open technologies and more access that in fact creates more bonds that both secures this autonomy, but also creates this, um, uh, uh, these uh, tools through with which we can start tackling the, the, these big challenge, be it the SDGs or the ones that we have touched on today in the panel. So with that, I wanna thank everyone who you know here in the panel for joining and you know rounding off this this summit it's been a long day um i i feel like it's it's uh, 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 definitely time to perhaps have a little glass of wine to round off it here uh, at, you know at home but um yeah thank you very much for joining and uh, yeah paula mm -hmm.